budget process that is mandated by the Charter, by the City Charter, and which will ultimately lead to the adoption of the fiscal 2019 budget, today we will hear testimony from Carmeline P. Malalis, Commissioner for the Commission on Human Rights. And Commissioner, it's a pleasure to see you again, and welcome again, you and your staff. Uh, in today's hearing, we will discuss highlights of the fiscal 2019 preliminary budget and the 2018 preliminary management report for the Commission on Human Rights. The fiscal 2019 preliminary budget for the Commission on Human Rights totals 14.1 million, including 11 million for the personal services, supporting 156 full-time employees and two million in other than personal services. Fiscal 2019 preliminary budget shows a decrease of 622,000 or 4% when compared with 14.7 million in the fiscal 2018 adopted budget. The fiscal 2018 budget for the commission as presented in the preliminary plan shows a decrease of 98,000 since adoption due in large part to a reduction in the PS and OTPS budget of the administration. We look forward to hearing from the Commission on Human Rights on its operation and fiscal 2019 exchange budget. Before I turn it over to the Commissioner, I would like to thank my committee staff, Sheila Johnson, financial analyst, Barkiz Mirig, committee counsel, and my staff, Rosine Genville and Adam Ulien, in my office. Once again, I want to thank everyone for being here today. And now I turn it over for the first part of this hearing to the Commissioner of Human Rights. Commissioner, please. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to answer council member questions honestly? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Eugene, uh, Council Member Lander, and members of uh, committee staff. Uh, I want to thank you for convening this afternoon's hearing. My name is Carmelyn P. Malalas, and I'm the Commissioner and Chairperson of the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Today I'm joined by Brittany Saunders, who's our Deputy Commissioner for Strategic Initiatives, as well as Lauren Elfont, who's my Chief of Staff. February marked my third year as Commissioner and Chairperson at the Commission, and I'm happy and excited to be with you here today to share some of what we've been accomplishing over the course of 2017. In a year that saw the city, like jurisdictions across the country, attempting to orient itself to the new and troubling federal reality, I'm happy to report that the Commission has continued to build upon its legacy of leadership in civil and human rights, and has fought every day to meet the challenges of our times. Note that I'm focusing my comments, unless otherwise noted, on the Commission's work and accomplishments during calendar year 2017, which is consistent with our testimony in prior budget hearings. With the enactment of Local Law 63 of 2018, which passed on December 19, 2017, the Commission is transitioning to reporting on a fiscal year basis in line with the Mayor's Mansion Report. And though we're not required to publish a report during this transition period, we are in the process of developing one in an effort to showcase all that my dedicated staff has accomplished by working with different communities throughout the city in 2017. And you will have that in the coming days. Thanks to the support of the administration and the council, the commission has nearly tripled its headcount. This is thanks to the investments that the administration and the council have made in our agency most recently with the baseline investment in fiscal year 18 adopted budget of just over $1.8 million to expand our law enforcement capacity and $750,000 to support the agency's critically important communications efforts. We are immensely grateful for these investments. When I began my tenure in February of 2015, we had a headcount of 56. 
As of today, the Commission has a headcount of 156, with 145 of these lines currently occupied. I am pleased to note that as we have hired into these positions, there have been many people dedicated to fighting for human rights who are eager to bring their experience and talents to the Commission. Some applicants approach the work from a very personal place as they come from communities or families that have experienced discrimination or harassment firsthand. Others come from careers demonstrating a deep commitment to inclusion and fostering dignity and respect amongst the city's most vulnerable communities. Still others are using the skills they developed within the private sector or other spaces to answer the call to public service now at this time when the responsibility for protecting vulnerable communities is falling more heavily upon the shoulders of local government. As a result, most of our new staff are themselves representative of the communities we have been reaching out to or come with well-developed relationships to those communities. Across the agency, our staff speak more than 35 languages, up from six just three years ago, and are well positioned to work closely with impacted communities. As noted above, we were thrilled to receive funding for 26 new lines as part of the fiscal year 2018 adopted budget. Those additional lines are allowing us to expand our general case management capacity in the Law Enforcement Bureau, as well as to create new units dedicated to streamlining intake, addressing discrimination on the basis of lawful source of income, investigating discriminatory harassment reports more expeditiously, and handling alleged violations of the Fair Chance Act. In 2017, inquiries from members of the public to the Commission continued to increase. Frontline staff fielded 9,772 inquiries via email, phone calls, and letters over the course of the year. Since 2015, the number of inquiries the agency receives annually has increased by nearly 85%, from 5,296 in 2015 to 9,772 in 2017. This includes 888 inquiries communicated in 18 languages other than English. The Law Enforcement Bureau filed complaints in 747 cases alleging a range of discriminatory practices. 50% of those cases were in employment and 35% were in housing. Disability-related claims were the most common protected class implicated, with 20% of claims residing in that category. Race discrimination was the next most common claim at 16%, with gender following at 13% and national origin at 10%. Strengthening the Commission's capacity to undertake affirmative investigations has been a priority since my appointment in 2015. And with recent shifts in civil rights enforcement and a retreat from the ethos of inclusion at the federal level, our focus on affirmative investigations at the local level is as important as ever. LEB is empowered to open such investigations into violations of the city human rights law through information provided anonymously by members of the public or when the media or community stakeholders report information about general trends of discrimination. In 2017, the Commission initiated 450 Commission-initiated investigations into potential violations, an increase from 426 in 2016. As in the previous year, the greatest number of commission-initiated investigations, 228, were in the area of employment. And within that category, Fair Chance Act protections were the most frequently raised. Commission-initiated investigations into housing were the next most common, with 203 investigations in this area, and the overwhelming majority focused on discrimination on the basis of lawful source of income. When commission-initiated investigations into public accommodations were concerned, the most frequently implicated protected class was disability. The commission has also deployed its enforcement resources to address blatant acts of discrimination and harassment by those who have been emboldened by the recognized emergence of white supremacy in our national discourse. Such was the case last August when the commission announced an investigation into allegations of tenant harassment at a Queens building where Nazi and Confederate imagery, swastikas, and other hate symbols had been displayed in the lobby. The investigation followed reports from a council member's office that tenants and condo owners were being subjected to a hostile environment and tenant harassment by their property manager. In launching this investigation, which was resolved by February of this year, the Commission sent a powerful signal that discrimination and harassment would not be tolerated. 
Testing remains an important investigative tool for LEB, allowing the Bureau to understand whether landlords, real estate brokers, restaurants, stores, hospitals, and other public accommodations treat individuals differently on the basis of their membership in a protected class. In 2017, LEB performed 577 tests compared to the 557 that were conducted the previous year. In 2017, 335 tests were conducted to investigate discrimination on the basis of conviction or arrest record or salary history in the area of employment. In the housing context, 206 tests were carried out to investigate discrimination on the basis of source of income, race, the presence of children, disability, and immigration status. And in the public accommodations context, 36 tests were carried out to investigate discrimination on the basis of disability or gender. Another priority of the Commission in the last three years has been establishing the agency as an equivalent venue for justice to state or federal court. As I have noted in the past, doing so required raising the standard of investigations, conducting in-depth investigations to identify pattern and practice violations, and obtaining respondents' full compliance with all areas of the city human rights law. The Commission also remains committed to ensuring that complainants' recoveries through settlement, conciliation, or litigation are equivalent to what they would receive if they chose to litigate their claim in state or federal court. As a result, LEB uh, case processing time to, has slightly increased from 536 days in 2016 to 581 days in 2017. This average time reflects the fact that the Commission continued to see an increase in reporting from the public for the second year in a row. At the same time, LEB continued its approach of conducting in-depth investigations into discrimination to ensure entities were fully complying with the city human rights law spending more time reviewing policies and interviewing witnesses and victims to determine whether there were additional violations. And notably, the Commission closed significantly more cases in 2017 than in previous years, 609 cases, which is up from 436 in 2016 and 354 in 2015. The Commission's Community Relations Bureau is charged with cultivating understanding and respect among the city's many diverse communities. At a time when the forces of hate and division seem to be disturbingly empowered, CRB is working to counter these forces through education, outreach, and relationship building. Our CRB Community Service Centers, or CSCs, located in all five boroughs, work actively with local communities, community leaders, community boards, houses of worship, elected officials, small businesses, community-based organizations, and schools to provide vital Know Your Rights and Know Your Obligations information. CRB hosts quarterly trainings and workshops in our CSEs and strives to deliver programming and services that reflect the needs of the surrounding communities. In 2017, the Commission's newly enforced and formed uh, excuse me, the Commission's newly formed bias response team responded to 86 bias incidents, primarily arising from incidents of targeting based on perceived gender identity and religion. The bias response team contacted victims to inform them of their rights, provided instructions on how to file complaints, and engaged in community-based actions, including literature drops, local events, and days of action. Instances of bias response team intervention reflect the disturbing trends we have all observed in recent years. For example, the team responded to tenant harassment in Queens. It conducted workshops for Bronx Community Board 7 in the wake of anti-Semitic incidents at a local institution. And the team also provided our Know Your Rights training at an Islamic center in Bay Ridge following an incident of Islamophobic vandalism. The Commission has also developed programming that is responsive to bias incidents, racism, and xenophobia. In 2017, racial justice emerged as an important focus for some of those efforts. In May, for example, after an immigrant street vendor from Burkina Faso was brutally assaulted in the South Bronx, the Commission hosted its first annual forum for African immigrant communities at the Metropolitan College of New York. CRB staff educated participants about their rights under the city human rights law, and over 20 community-based organizations and city agencies were on hand to provide information on government resources and legal protections for African immigrants. 
The commission also hosted a series of events focused on racial justice. These included a panel discussion on the impact of gentrification in Bed-Stuy, a mobile legal services clinic at a neighborhood church in Bed-Stuy, and a community response effort that included providing Know Your Rights information and legal screenings to Brooklyn community members following the reports of racial discrimination in a local restaurant. In Harlem, we have been partnering with community-based organizations with a similar focus in order to identify how the Commission's outreach and enforcement resources can support community residents. We look forward to even deeper engagement in Bed-Stuy, Harlem, and other parts of the city in 2018 as part of our racial justice efforts. CRB also has an important role to play in the Commission's efforts to combat housing discrimination. In 2017, the agency continued to educate housing providers and community groups on their rights and obligations under the law, offering 263 fair housing workshops and presentations, and hosting its fifth annual Fair Housing Symposium at Hostos College in the Bronx. Commission staff provided our Know Your Rights workshops to over 200 tenants, advocates, service providers, attorneys, and tenant organizations with a special focus on combating lawful source of income discrimination. As is our practice, we also brought our Law Enforcement Bureau's mobile intake lawyers to this community event, ensuring that attorneys were on site to address questions and take housing complaints on the spot from attendees. CRB's Project Equal Access is central to the agency's efforts to address discrimination faced by individuals with disabilities. PEA, short for Project Equal Access, identifies barriers to accessibility in housing, workspaces, and public accommodations, resolving them prior to intervention by LEB. In situations where immediate intervention, rather than going through a litigation process, allows people to engage in basic life functions, like leaving one's home, PEA is invaluable. PEA staff regularly conduct workshops and engage in collaborative discussions with the relevant parties to address accessibility issues and encourage quick resolutions. In 2017, PEA successfully negotiated 216 modifications across the city. These included accessibility improvements like the addition of ramps and automatic door openers in restaurants and apartment buildings, the creation of accessible supermarket check checkout lanes, and the addition of lifts in medical facilities. As a result of PEA's work, not only are access issues addressed on a faster timeline, but cases are diverted from the LEB pipeline, saving valuable enforcement resources. In the three years since I established the Office of the Chair, it has grown into a critically important department. It is the point of contact for the Commission's interagency and external partnerships. It negotiates legislation and promulgates rules and legal guidance. It convenes our appointed commissioners on a quarterly basis and serves the Commission's adjudicatory functions, including issuing decisions and orders. Increasingly, the, the Office of the Chair has been responding to legal inquiries from the public regarding the Commission's work, often about newly implemented changes to the law. Building upon its work in the last two years, the Office of the Chair was intensely active in 2017. The Commission issued new rules in the Fair Chance Act, which requires employers to consider an applicant's qualifications and extend a conditional offer of employment before inquiring into their criminal history and new rules on the Stop Credit Discrimination in Employment Act, which prohibits consideration of an applicant's credit history for most jobs in New York City. Both sets of rules re represent the first substantive rulemaking by the Commission in decades. In 2017, two new protections were added to the city human rights law. As of October 31st, the law prohibits employers from asking job applicants about their salary history during the, the hiring process. To provide transparency on the Commission's enforcement of the new provision, we issued an FAQ and materials advising applicants and employers of their respective rights and obligations under the law. Consistent with the Commission's commitment to transparency and public education, the agency also convened a roundtable with employers and met with hundreds of employment lawyers to help inform the city's employers and business communities about the law's new salary history protections. Also in partnership with the Department of Veteran Services, the Commission published educational materials to inform the public about new protections for current and former members of the military against discrimination in employment, housing, and public accommodations, which went into effect on November 19, 2017. 
the Office of the Chair also provided guidance about pre-existing protections that frequently impact veterans, including protections based on disability and lawful source of income. I'm especially proud of the efforts that the Commission has made this year to both drive and be responsive to the public dialogue on civil and human rights. One such effort was another project coordinated by the Office of the Chair, the Commission's 2017 Survey of Muslim, Arab, South Asian, Jewish, and Sikh New Yorkers, which was conducted at a time when reports of hate and bias-based attacks against these groups were on the rise. The agency collected data from members of these communities across the five boroughs in order to understand their experiences with discrimination, with bias, and bias-motivated harassment and violence. More than 3,000 New Yorkers completed the survey, which was available in Arabic, Bengali, English, French, Hindi, Punjabi, Russian, Urdu, and Yiddish, among other languages. The data collected will inform a report to be published in 2018. And our hope is that the recommendations therein will inform the Commission and other city agencies about how to better address and combat bias-motivated harassment, discrimination, and violence against these communities. Months before the Me Too movement achieved its current prominence, the Office of the Chair also began planning a public hearing on sexual harassment in the workplace. On December 6, 2017, the Commission convened the citywide hearing, which was the first Commission hearing on gender discrimination since one of my predecessors, now Congressperson Eleanor Holmes Norton, held the country's first public hearings on sexual harassment in the workplace over 40 years ago. The December hearing furnished an opportunity for workers, advocates, activists from a wide range of industries, among them construction, fashion, media, domestic work, tech, finance, hospitality, and others, to speak about the harassment and discrimination that they or others in their field have experienced. People also testified regarding the challenges, whether related to Byzantine policies, unsupportive employers, or outright retaliation, involved in addressing the behavior. The Commission heard testimony from some of New York City's most vulnerable workers, including women in male-dominated industries, women of color, immigrant workers, low-wage workers, workers in isolated workspaces, and LGBTQ workers. We also continue to receive written testimony through the end of the year. The agency is currently analyzing all the submissions, and this analysis will form the basis of a report and policy recommendations that will be released later this year. The Commission also published seven decisions and orders in 2017. These cases involve gender discrimination and retaliation in employment, lawful source of income discrimination in housing, disability-based discrimination and harassment, among other issues. In these decisions and orders, we have mandated tens of thousands of dollars in damages, as well as civil penalties. We're proud of the role that each of these findings plays in reinforcing the discrimination and harassment won't be tolerated by the Commission or in New York City. In 2017, the Office of Communications and Marketing at the Commission worked to amplify not only the work of the Commission, but the values that distinguish this city. In 2017, the Commission garnered some 700 earned media hits, publicity gained through promotional efforts other than paid media advertising across print, online, TV, and radio. This is nearly double its press coverage from 2016. This office has managed to do this while also prioritizing reaching vulnerable New Yorkers who need our resources the most. In 2017, almost half of all press hits were in ethnic and community media, providing accessible means for New Yorkers to learn about their rights, regardless of language, religion, or national origin. In 2017, we built upon our previous experience fielding compelling, timely campaigns such as BUNYC and I Am Muslim NYC to launch new effort. In June, the Commission launched a citywide anti-discrimination campaign, You Do Have Rights, NYC, to affirm every New Yorker's right to live, work, and pray free from discrimination and harassment. The campaign, which, which was accompanied by the hashtag, You Have Rights, NYC, helped to further establish the Commission as a venue for justice for three target audiences, New Yorkers of faith, people of color, and immigrants. These target audiences were selected based on data from complaints and bias-based incidents occurring across the city. With powerful eye-catching imagery and text, the campaign conveyed a simple yet powerful message that no New Yorker deserves to be subjected to discrimination or harassment, and those who do can count on the commission for support. 
Over the course of the six-week campaign, more than 3,400 placements were made citywide. Advertisements appeared in 25 ethnic and community newspapers and radio stations, and 77 million impressions generated through online and outdoor media. Campaign videos garnered nearly a million views on Facebook, Hulu, and YouTube. The Commission has continued its focus on investing in New York City's rich ethnic and community media outlets. Through these outlets, the Commission provides essential information to our city's most vulnerable and hard-to-reach communities. In 2017, 100% of our radio and print advertising budget was either in community or ethnic media. The Commission regularly produces and places advertisements on its initiatives and programs in ethnic media and social media in various languages other than English, including in Arabic, Spanish, Chinese, Korean, and Urdu. The office also played an instrumental role by developing and disseminating materials to educate New Yorkers about changes to the city human rights law, including the ban on salary history inquiries and protections for members of the uniformed services. The Commission's annual budget for fiscal year 2018 was $14,856,979 in city tax levy money and grants and approximately $350,000 in additional grant funding through a contract with the EEOC pursuant to our workshare agreement. The mayor's preliminary budget tax levy for fiscal year 2019 provides for a budget of $14,137,300. As I review our accomplishments in 2017, I'm extremely proud of both the good we've been able to do in the service of people of New York and the ways in which we have strengthened an agency consistent with its legacy. With the support of the administration and the council, we have demonstrated the power of strategic enforcement, as well as the flexibility to dynamically adjust to the changing political environment. We have expanded and deepened our relationships with New Yorkers and their understanding of their rights and obligations to one another. We have leveraged the agency's policymaking capacity and partnered with city, uh, city's sister agencies and offices for deeper impact and we have lifted our voices across a variety of platforms to stand up for the values that make the city great. While our current landscape is a challenging one, I am grateful to this work each day and deeply appreciate your continued partnership. Thank you again for convening to this hearing and thank you for your support of the commission as we continue to rebuild and reinvigorate it. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, before I start asking some questions, I want to acknowledge that we have been joined by Councilmember Lander and Councilmember Parkins. Thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Uh, Commissioner, as the Commission discussed with the Office of Management and Budget, a restructure of its unit of appropriation as, uh, for example, uh, associated uh, you know, with the budget code to accurately reflect the operation of the agencies. For example, unit of appropriation 003 and 004 is, na oh, 004 is named community development, which reflects the uh, commission major funding source prior to fiscal 2016. Is there any communication, any dialogue, any talking in terms of uh, doing a restructure of uh, those uh, units? Just to be clear on the question, are you asking me if there's communications between the commission and OMB regarding changes in the appropriation of our budget between 2016, fiscal year 2016 and the present? Yes. Yes. Hmm. Does the commission have uh, sufficient resources to carry out? L let me say that before that. Uh, could you tell us in detail what is the goal, what is the mission? I know that you spoke about that, but I want you to talk a little bit more about the detail about the goal and also the, the role of the uh, Commission of Human Rights. What is the mission and the goal of our yeah. agency? Yeah, of the uh, agency. To, so the, I would say the mission and the goal of the Commission on Human Rights is to combat discrimination and harassment across the city. 
Uh, and we have different tools in our toolbox in order to do that. Some of it's civil law enforcement, some of it's community engagement and education, some of it's policy and legislation, and um, others are communication and just uh, forms of public education and different community uh, 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 media and uh, through community organizations and different stakeholders uh, in New York City. But broadly speaking, it's to combat discrimination and harassment across the city. I know that you mentioned that during your testimony. But what I want to ask, I want to ask, do, do you have enough resources to carry out you know, this goal, to reach out the goal? Yeah, I, you know, I, so I've been the chair and commissioner for the agency for a little bit over three years now. Uh, and I think in the last three years, we've seen the agency grow significantly. You know, as I said in my testimony, we grew from an agency of 55 to now we're at a total headcount of 156. Uh, and so, you know, as with prior years, I, I always uh, look forward to working with both uh, the administration and folks at council to make sure that the agency has the resources it needs to continue growing. Well, did you identify any no, new needs of the agency that require more funding? And did you submit also those needs to the administration, to the mayor office? Yeah. So I think, you know, as, as we've done in prior years, we've been engaged in a back and forth uh, with the council and looking, you know, also kind of uh, taking account of how we've used the resources that we've been provided uh, in the most recent uh, uh, budget additions, you know, we received 26 new lines to really take into account how we can best uh, use uh, additional resources, if any. You know, Commissioner, I think I mentioned that during our first meeting that, and we all know that New York City is home to so many people, so many immigrants, people coming from all over the world and people who speak different languages, and I'm so happy, and I commend you for that. I commend the commission, because I, uh, through your testimony, you mentioned that your staff speaks several languages. That's great. But uh, could you uh, tell us about uh, the demographic component of your staff? The demographic components of my component, staff? The ethnic yeah, component, yeah. Demographic. Are, are there certain Do you categories? Have, let me put it another way. Yeah. Uh, we want to know the diversity of your staff. Is your staff is very diverse. Mm -hmm. Do we have people from across New York City? So we say we, we, we know that, and I say that, and you know that. In New York City, in New York City, we have people from all over the place. And when we are talking about human rights, so we are talking about the right of everybody, whether they speak English or not. Mm -hmm. Born in the United States or not, it doesn't matter of the race, the place of birth, or uh, gender, or, or faith, or the religion. So what I'm trying to figure out, do you have in your staff people that reflect the communities that the commission serves? Uh, I do. Um, you know, I also, I'm somebody who thinks of diversity as being, you know, uh, uh, something that could also always uh, improve. Um, so uh, I think that our, our agency, I'm proud, frankly, of the, the level of diversity that we have in terms of race and ethnicity and gender and gender identity and expression and sexual orientation and religion um, and any host of factors. I think that uh, I said earlier that across our staff, our staff speak more than 35 languages. I think that's in part indicative of the level of diversity we have. I can tell you that, you know, if you look even at my most senior staffing level, 85% of my most senior staffing uh, are women, women-led. Um, and then, you know, we've been, we've been very fortunate that a lot of the, the people who are, I think, attracted to work at the commission are folks who are coming from communities across the city in all five boroughs where they are, they are attracted to work at the agency because they see how the agency is making real efforts to reach out to different communities across the city. So um, I, I'm happy with the diversity that we have. I'm not resting on our, you know, my, my laurels on that. I'm always looking to increase and improve diversity, just like I think any leadership should. 
Uh, before I continue with my question, I just want to mention that we have been joined by Councilmember Wozentel. Thank you very much, Councilmember. Uh, it seemed that uh, there was the, there was no report for 2017, annual report for 2017. When the report will be released? Can so we, we will be releasing our annual report um, in the next few weeks. So in prior years, we were required by statute to, to release an annual report in early March of the year that covered the calendar year. This is the first year that we are no longer required by statute to do that because, as I said earlier, um, by, uh, by a local law that was passed in December of 2017, we are now transitioning from reporting from a calendar year to, um, to the fiscal year to mirror the mayor's management report. Uh, but it's, even though we are not required to provide an annual report this year, we will be providing one in the next few weeks. But we have seen also there's a substantial growth in the budget and in also in the head count of the uh, institution. Uh, could you tell us if there have been also some modification in structure and some effort to make sure that uh, the growth of the budget and headcount reflect also the, uh, uh, the, the job that uh, the commission is doing? Yes, I think, you know, I think there's been, um, again, I'm very appreciative of the process that's taken place between the administration and the council in the last three years. Um, the last three years, I think, have been very interesting, to say the least, in the field of civil and human rights, and the types of inquiries and the, the quantity of inquiries that have come into our agency have reflected that. Um, and what we have tried to do, I mean, going from, again, a staff of 56 to a staff of 156 is considerable growth within a three-year period. Uh, and so we have been, you know, very heavily engaged in what I think of as kind of dynamically staffing the agency. There have been several modifications, I think probably across the agency in each of those three years to make sure that with our resources, um, you know, we, we, we've grown considerably, but we're still quite a small agency when you consider the vast mandate of the agency. So we, we have tried to dynamically figure out how we had to readjust given the, uh, the demands that have been coming into the commission. So, for example, if I look at 2016, <clears throat> you know, at the end of 2016, we had a 60% increase in reporting to the agency. In 2017, that has, cons that has consistently increased. And so, you know, when we saw that there was an increase in that reporting, we had worked with uh, the council and, and the administration to increase uh, our, mostly our, our law enforcement bureau staffing capacity, which is where most of the 26 new lines came in in the last fiscal year. Yes, I've been listening, yeah. Okay. Uh, you know that uh, uh, the commission has been uh, providing a lot of training, workshop everywhere, but could you tell us about uh, our training online? Do you, does the commission provide also training online? We do not currently online? provide online trainings. Uh, I'm sorry? We do not currently provide online trainings. Oh, you don't? We course. do not. So why? I mean, I will say, you know, my background is as an advocate in the private sector. Mm -hmm. I personally preferred in-person trainings to online trainings, I think. Um, I think, you know, the, the amount of people that you can reach, it, it's tougher to reach, uh, you know, larger quantities of people with in-person trainings, but trainings tend to be a lot more effective. And as we've been trying to, uh, you know, uh, rebuild the reputation of this agency and get people again to trust the work of the agency, having in-person trainings has been a good mechanism to have people actually meet commission staff and have human relationships with the people they're working with at this agency. You know, I probably, uh, I don't blame you for that because I love also the direct contact with the people, with the people in the community, yep. which are directly people. But because of we are in the era of technology, so do you feel that also it would be good to extend the training to the online, 
you know, uh, opportunity? You know, it could be in some areas. It's, it's definitely been again, something. Don't, again, you know, I love the way you approach, you know, the out, outlook, the outreach of the uh, people. People, I love contacting people also, go to the community, you know, reach out to people directly. But I, since we are using so much technology, many people rely on technology, go online to find out information and see what's going on. Don't you believe that, that there would be a good thing also to extend the outreach, you know, through uh, uh, internet or online, social media and stuff like that? Yes, it's certainly under uh, consideration. I'm most concerned with the effectiveness of trainings. Um, and so we have been considering different ways that we could roll out web-based trainings that would be similarly effective and impact the audience of those trainings. Okay. Uh, it seems that uh, the commission has been only certified UNT visa agency since 2016. Why it's so late? Why not before? I will point out that we are the first such local agency to certify for U visas and provide T visa declarations. I don't know that, um, first of all, I would have to go back in my mind to find out when U and T visas actually became available through federal immigration uh, enforcement. But um, we're the first local such agency to do so. I don't know that there was great understanding that local agencies like the Commission on Human Rights would be able to provide them. So I think we're actually early to the game, not late to the game. So now the, the, the commission is certified, is a certified agency for UNT visa. Did you identify new challenges because of the certification, because of this new task imposed in the commission? New tasks associated with uh, No challenges since uh, you know, I think to date we've been pretty pleased with the way our certification program has, has functioned. Um, you know, recently the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs um, ha released a report, State of Our Immigrant City Report. Um, and if you look at that report, you'll see in 2017, um, I think there was a total of 709 law enforcement certifications that were issued across the city by different city agencies. Um, so we are, we are certainly a contributor to that, but in order for us to certify your, you, uh, uh, certifications or T declarations, there has to be a nexus with the city human rights law. So there has to be a qualifying crime that is also, um, a, a violation of the city human rights law. So we are inherently dealing with a more limited population of claims. Mm -hmm. So that means you don't believe that, that we'll have any impact on the budget of the commission? You don't believe that uh, there will be a need for additional resources to address uh, this very important issue? You know, it's something that we're thinking about, you know, uh, in consideration of all the other things that the commission has been engaged in in the last few years. Um, but it does not specifically stand out as something in my mind. In fiscal year 2018, adopted the 70, 50,000 was baseline. In the other than the personal services, OTPS budget for communication in fiscal year 2018 to 2021. Could you tell us what projects have been included in the fiscal year 2018 and 2019? What type of project? I'm sorry, what was the What one? project? has been included in between uh, 2018 and 2019 for this amount of money? So one of our priorities in the last three years has been making sure that, you know, across the city, uh, people are aware of what the commission does and the commission's work through different citywide public campaigns. And usually they consist of, you know, campaign posters uh, in transit stations like the subways, in bus shelters, uh, at city kiosks, also uh, public, service, public service announcement type videos that run on um, NYC media and in other, uh, and in other uh, venues. And um, 
you know, consistent with what we've done in the past, last year we had released a citywide campaign that I think of as a very kind of evergreen type campaign for what the commission's work is. It was entitled, You, you Do Have Rights NYC. I said earlier that we saw a 60% increase in inquiries to the agency. A lot of them were based on religion or national origin or race. So we wanted a campaign to kind of capture what some of those uh, complaints, how they manifested, that type of discrimination, how that manifested across the city. Um, so that was one way that we did it by running this uh, citywide campaign, similarly to the others in transit stations with videos. And as we look forward into, um, into uh, this year, we are looking again similarly to run uh, a campaign, this one based on sexual harassment, since that has obviously been a, a, a very big topic of conversation. And it's very important that folks know locally how they can file uh, uh, cases and claims with the Commission on Human Rights. Uh, we know that uh, the Commission has been doing a lot of effort to reach out uh, the New Yorkers to make sure that uh, people are informed, are educated about the human rights uh, issues and their rights and the uh, responsibility also. We know that uh, the Commission has been providing a lot of trainings, workshops, but uh, what is your method of uh, evaluation? How do you evaluate? the efficiency of the campaign, the impact of the, of the campaign on the community or the communities that you serve. So we have the, you know, we have the general metrics that one would look at when looking at campaign results. So we can look at, for instance, if we're looking at any of the, uh, the campaign that was in digital format, you were mentioning technology earlier. So anything on social media, I can say that you know, we've had 10 million impressions generated from across digital media from our campaigns. 148,000 clicks uh, to the Commission Salary History campaign page. And this is just looking at, as an example, what we did with salary history since that was a new provision of the law that became effective on October 31st. We had more than 3,000 new likes on the Commission's Facebook page, 3,598 shares of campaign advertisements on Facebook. So that's just an example of looking at one uh, individualized campaign and what we were able to look at and the metrics we were able to look at based on social media. Based on your uh, ev evaluation or observation, do you believe there are other steps, new steps that should be taken to improve the outreach or uh, the education of uh, the people? I I any other thing that you believe that should be done that can implement, you know, uh, empower what uh, you, the Commission is doing in terms of reaching out people, educating people? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that there's always a great combination of kind of the in-person type outreach that happens through our community service centers and our community relations bureau as well as what we find in communications related materials like the campaigns that I was just mentioning and we're always thinking of you know what are the better forms that that campaigns can take based on the different populations that might be disparately impacted or disproportionately targeted depending on what those those different provisions of the law are so we are we're always considering that okay um, again uh, you know one of the things that I'm very concerned about is uh, reaching out people, educating people. I think we discussed that when we met. Uh, when we talk about uh, human rights, if people don't know exactly what we are talking about, the situation is going to be chaotic, regardless of what we are doing. And I'm so pleased that you have a big portion of your effort you know, go, that goes to education and training. Now I'm going to call up Council Member Lender for some questions. Council Member, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm going to follow up on a number of the things you've asked. And Commissioner, as always, it's good to see you and your and your team here. And I certainly uh, heartily agree that the um, the growth in your work, both it's just the resources and the headcount and the diligence you've brought to it, have been uh, would have been necessary in any case, and obviously have been just so so important these last couple of years. So thank you to you and your team. Um, 
uh, and obviously, you know, we've, we've worked hard together and we pushed last year and we were able to add some resources and headcount. I do just want to start by asking, it's a relatively modest decrease, but the budget, the budget for this year is less than the budget for last year. So, and it looks like that's mostly in OTPS, like just get a really good health insurance rate or something. <laughs> I, you know, what, what's yeah. the, uh, what, what accounts for the... So, you know, in order to, to fit the new PS-related lines in our, in our physical space, we had to make certain adjustments to our physical space, you know, additions of cubicles and figuring out different uh, uh, techn technological issues with regards to, to having that additional space. And so that OTPS money really accounts for um, the, the work that had to be done to our physical space in order to accomplish that. Last year's money was a one-time yes. reconfiguration yes. and furniture. Yes. It was a rollover from the prior year in order to make sure that we would be able to actually uh, add the, the additional PS lines into our physical space. Got it. So there isn't a, a cut of any recurring expenses. There was a one-time expense associated with the space. Correct. Okay. That's good. Um, I will note some advocates certainly did the math and noted that if we just took the 1991, you know, peak headcount and adjusted for inflation, not even for New York City's 1.6 million additional uh, people since 1991, but just for inflation, you'd be, I think, at about uh, 17 or 18 million dollars. So uh, we still are not, you know, um, back at the peak budget, relative, you know, of, of New York City adjusted for inflation for human rights at a time when we sure need to be. So. Um, I'll just flag that, you know, that it would be good to be able to do even more of the work that, uh, that you're doing. And I guess I do want to start, you know, last year part of the way we pushed hard to get um, increases was focusing on the caseload processing time. You spoke to this a little in your testimony about the fact that you are looking increasingly at pattern and practices and trying to make sure, but so I wonder, do you, is there a way that you can pull those apart then? Obviously, if you've got an investigation that you're looking more deeply into because it might connect with others, um, you know, it makes sense that it might take a while. But if we have a New Yorker with a very particular complaint who's just trying to get justice in the, in the face of a civil rights violation, um, you know, 514 days is that's a long time. So to talk a little about, I guess maybe it's two different questions. What are you doing to try to make sure you're processing those cases as quickly as you can given the, the needs of the case? And are you able to separate those where you are looking into connecting it with others and doing pattern and practice investigation from those where you're just trying to deliver justice for the individual? Yeah, so I think there's a few different issues in there. Thank you for that question. Um, it, it, it's a great one. Um, First of all, I, you know, I, I'd note that the majority of the new lines that were added to the commission, they were literally onboarded in December of 2017. So I think the full effect of those lines has not yet hit our case processing time. I think as people have acclimated to the agency and we're able to fully utilize that new headcount, we will see a change. I also think something that's been very important for us, I mentioned our dynamic staffing model earlier, and that means that, you know, even structurally within departments, you know, the structures have changed. And part of that for us has been creating, uh, you know, new things like our, um, our uh, intake unit, cr creating a source of income unit, um, uh, strengthening our uh, uh, equal access, project equal access type unit. So I think increasingly we're gonna be thinking and creating a bias response team. We're, in we're increasingly looking at ways that we could be diverting things from the law enforcement bureau's pipeline of cases and trying to resolve cases that should be resolved expeditiously and early on in that way. Um, so I think increasingly as we look to dynamically staff the agency, we'll be looking towards, you know, how do we, how we, how do, we do even more in the area of pre-complaint intervention? And, you know, I know that, you know, if I just look at 2017, calendar year 2017, our, uh, our pre-complaint interventions have again increased. And so I think in 2017 we had something like 47 um, uh, pre-complaint related interventions, which meant there were 47 situations in which rather than having to file a complaint and go through the litigation process, either through the Community Relations Bureau or through one of the new units, 
in the law enforcement bureau, we were able to resolve those claims and they didn't have to even go into that pipeline. And we are increasingly looking to do that. Source of income is another area, another issue. In the past, it's been a third of our housing docket. As we've been doing a lot more in the area of housing, I think it's now a fifth of our docket, source mm -hmm. of income related cases. And we, and we now have a, a, a very specific source of income unit that is looking at violations of the law in that space. A lot of the work that's been done in that unit, which was, again, just staffed, I think, in January of 2018, has been looking at ways that we can be using information and leveraging that information to resolve situations and get people into housing without having to file complaints or, or file cases. So I think we're still seeing the benefits of the increased uh, headcount, and we're going to start seeing more benefits from the new units. And that it'll be good to hear, you know, yep. both on case processing, but also, as you know, the council is long on source of income, been yep. eager to find what more we can do. So as you have some results from those things, uh, that would be great. You mentioned this new bias response team, and I wonder if you could tell us a little more about it. Maybe you've reported to the council on, on that, but I, I don't remember, you know, learning that sure. much about it. So just um, tell us a little more about it. How big is it? Um, how should we think about it in relationship to the NYPD, you know, like if, if there's a, you know, a swastika or a, some hate, you know, Islamophobic graffiti, we usually reach out to the NYPD. How, what's, how should we understand this bias response team? What's it doing so far? How big is it? How does it work with the NYPD? I didn't mean it as a trick question. No, no, sure. <laughs> so, um, so it's again when, when I'm thinking of how we're trying to dynamically staff the agency, it was another one of the units that created to do that. So it is primarily staffed by community relations bureau human rights uh, specialists, um, and then also staffed by the discriminatory harassment investigators that came in as part of new lines through last year's budget cycle. It's, it's a relatively small unit right now. I want to say, I can get you the, the total number later on after the hearing. I want to say it's probably around 10 people, a little bit more. But if I, again, if I look at what they were able to accomplish in, um, in 2017 alone, I think there were, there were something like 86 bias incidents that they were able to respond to. And, and those incidents were, primarily in the areas of um, discrimination based on perceived gender identity and religion. And so what they would do is they would go into the area, the specific communities where uh, they were seeing these types of bias incidents, and they would contact victims to inform them of their rights. They would provide instructions on how they should be filing complaints at the agency. Uh, they'd engage in other types of community-based actions like literature drops or events or days of action. It was really, an, it's really an effort to come into the effective community and let them know both how they can access the resources of the agency and also create awareness of rights in the space to try to deter future bias incidents from happening in that space. So that makes a lot of sense, especially because what we've had before is just the NYPD's hate crimes task force. And I mean, of course, you want to look at a criminal incident as a crime and get the NYPD out there, but those are often, you know, graffiti where it's hard to catch the person and, and also where the broader issues are really relevant, so just focusing on who did it. So, um, but just tell me a little more, how, I mean, where are people supposed to report these things? How do you work with the NYPD in terms of your numbers and their numbers of incidents? How, how are those things handled? You know, we, we, uh, we work with NYPD in the sense that we get um, and analyze their hate crimes reports, I want to say monthly. Um, and so we're able to take a look at that to see if, there's thing, if there are incidents that it makes sense for us and our team with our resources to, to follow up on. But mostly things get rooted to our bias response team from other areas of the commission. So they could get rooted to the bias response team from you know, intake or, or uh, in the law enforcement bureau or from our website where they will isolate it, see if this makes sense more to go for the, to the bias response team than it does through the, than to go to, you know, the, the usual investigatory process for LEB, and they'll take a hold of those cases. So like another example, I think, where we were able to intervene fairly quickly is 
uh, folks heard about the tenant there, there was a lot of media around this tenant harassment issue in Sunnyside Queens where there was you know Nazi and Confederate imagery up uh, in the lobby of a building um, and so the the tenants and residents of the building felt very harassed by that it was very intimidating and so our bias response team uh, in, uh, initiated uh, you know their their um, community outreach in that effort they were worked with um, I want to say council member Van Bramer in order to get more information in that in that scenario um, and as a result of approaching the case in that way I think that case resolved I want to say within four months so that was a, a, a pretty quick timeline uh, for, for one of those cases and certainly much more abbreviated than what would have happened through a litigation context. And one thing I might suggest is for that unit, for the public and even for council members to like produce something that lets us know, like I don't think of those, some of these things we're talking about as things I would have reached out to the commission for, um, again, just because we're kind of conditioned to go through the NYPD's hate crimes task yep. force. So be useful, I mean, it's good that you're routing things from other places in the commission, but let us know what we should be sending your way um, here when it unfortunately happens. Um, all right, my last question, I, I noted with interest this um, uh, test in your testimony on this Project Equal Access, which yep. is a similar kind of pre-complaint effort to focus on barriers to accessibility. We've been working with the Department of Small Business Services and the Mayor's Office for People with Disabilities to enable SPS to be more proactive with small businesses, to let them know at a full, you know, a range of points about what they can, be, can and should be doing. And then I noticed that Department of Consumer Affairs does a little bit of that. They have a couple of proactive people that try to let folks know about what to be looking for before they get hit with a complaint from an inspector. And it sounds like you guys have one too, but maybe it would be good to connect the dots between those things and make sure um, you know, folks are comparing notes. We, we did this because some small businesses in our neighborhoods were getting hit with lawsuits, some legitimate and some a little more questionable about lack of accessibility of sort of, you know, storefronts in very old commercial shopping strips where, anyway, but it's really important, obviously, to make those more accessible. So it's great you have this, but I might just suggest checking in with those other agencies and seeing if we can make sure resources should be shared so that we can get the word out to as many people as possible and help them make their make their workplaces. And I will say we coordinate well. quite a bit with both of those agencies um, on disability-related issues and other issues, so. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member Lender. Uh, we have been joined also by Council Member Kelos. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that Council Member Rosendel has some questions, but before I turn it over to her, related to the bias team, uh, I'm very, very sensitive to culture, tradition, of the different group of people living in New York City. When you have a bias intervention team, but uh, uh, I think we got to make sure that we have people also that represent different uh, communities in New York City. Because uh, if you have somebody who's going to intervene in situation and don't even have a clue of the tradition, of the culture of yeah. the person they are going to be in contact with, so that can create a problem. Could you speak a little bit about the diversity of the bias intervention team, please? Sure. So uh, our, our bias response team speaks several different languages. Uh, I could get back to you on how many there are. They speak at least seven different languages. Um, again, similar to commission staff, they're pulled from you know, uh, many different areas of the city. Uh, in addition to our bias response team, we also have lead advisors in specific areas that are specific to communities that have been, um, I, th I think, targeted or under attack or what we consider to be more vulnerable communities within the city. So for instance, we have folks that are looking specifically as lead advisors or liaisons to uh, Muslim, Arab, South Asian communities in the city, mm -hmm. um, to Jewish communities throughout the city, to African communities throughout the city to uh, transgender and gender nonconforming communities throughout the city, so a range of different uh, communities throughout the city. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Council Member Rosenthal. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Eugene, Chair Dr. Eugene. Great to see you, um, Commissioner. 
I, I want to focus in on the new sexual harassment legislation that we're all considering. We had a hearing on. Um, I guess my overall question is, do you feel you have the staffing needed to implement the laws that we've been talking about, the added responsibilities that you'll need to take on? Um, you know, specifically, I'm thinking about um, requiring information about sexual harassment to be made um, online to make it part of your community outreach work um, as you're educating the community on the variety of human rights laws um, as you, you know, hopefully, to be honest with you, get a di more and more complaints um, about sexual harassment because people will know that uh, your commission is there to serve them. Um, and also changing the, uh, limit, the time limits for filing a case from one to three years. You know, so if I'm thinking of like the 11 bills that I know have been under consideration and um, have been discussed quite a bit, uh, I think through with our agency and other entities within the administration and the council, I think that um, we would have to look at how the how each of the bills kind of lands to, to figure out what, what you know what's needed to in order to implement on on the bills. Some of those bills were uh, bills in which I think we the Commission on Human Rights would have direct responsibilities, and some of them were ones where DCAS would have more direct responsibilities. So I think um, I know that that process is still underway, and I think as the the bills are finalized, we'll have a better sense of you know what if any needs we have with relation to those different bills. Do you think it might be possible that there are no needs? You know, uh, <laughs> not wanting to comment without having actually seen the finalized bills, I, I really don't know. I really can't say. Do you expect to be supported if additional staff are required um, in making sure that those positions are funded? I do. I think that you know, through prior um, through through prior budget cycles, I think that the administration and the council have worked very well together to to support this agency. So I do Great. expect that. No, I'm pleased to hear that. The um, mayor's uh, PPMR PMMR, the management report. Um, yeah, that's right. Looks at the goal of educating the community on um, human rights laws, and interestingly, and I apologize if you were asked this previously, but if you look at some of the um, indicators, the numbers seem to be going down. Um, I'm really happy that the number for conferences, workshops, and training sessions overall has uh, doubled over the last two years, so that's amazing. But community-based technical assistance, maybe it's the change in the definition, but it yeah. seems to drop by 40 or 50%. Um, and same with the school-based training sessions conducted, seems to have dropped by 75%. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about those. Uh, so, Council Member Rosenthal, I think you were not here when I said this earlier in my testimony, but no worries. I was looking for it. I was looking for it. <laughs> but basically, our um, our annual budget testimony is generally based off of our calendar year reports, um, and this is the first year that we were not required to do an, uh, an annual report because we we're actually transitioning off the calendar year into the fiscal year. So, the PMMR, the Mayor's Management Report, is is not accurately correct collecting the information because it has like a half year value or something? Well, I, I would say it is to that, it is to the metrics that it's capturing. Um, but, so what I'm saying is the, the numbers and information I have are really regarding the, the, the calendar year versus the fiscal year, which is what the PMMR is looking at. So I'd be happy to get back to you on that. What I could say broadly is that I think that the way that we look at some of the commission's work has just shifted. So you might look at that and see that technical assistance in our community relations bureau 
um, has gone down. I think you said the figure looks like it has gone down. 56,000 to 32,000. But technical assistance is generally, again, considered, you know, one of the, the things that I was speaking to Council Member Lander about, which is our pre-complaint related interventions. So it's very possible that the numbers that, you, that we would have in the past put into the, the technical assistance category are now put into another category because they're all part of what we now consider to be pre-complaint intervention. But again, I'm happy to get you no, more no, information No, no, that helps. That. So if I look at pre-complaint intervention, I'm seeing the number of cases filed go up from roughly 700 in 2015 to roughly 800 in 17. So that's good, although between 16 and 17, it came down by 100. I'm just looking at the mayor's management sure. report numbers. Um, but this is by the tens of thousands, the reduction um, in the community training technical assistance. So, um, you know, I'm a big fan of footnotes. Yeah. I mean, if it's that the mayor's management report needs footnotes, you know, I think that's I, I would urge whoever's looking at that now to include footnotes. It's, it's hard for the general, it would be hard, it is hard for me as yep. also a member of the general public, public to understand what's going on here. And especially, I'm, I'm most concerned about it because we are shifting with the new sexual harassment laws. Um, you know, we are hopeful that your pre-complaint office will be getting lots of calls. And um, I, I'm concerned to see all those numbers. I, I don't understand what's happening then, I guess, with those numbers. So I'd like an explanation of that, if you could send that as a follow-up to sure. know whether or not you're in a, a place to accommodate the hundreds more sure. that we hope to get. I would also say PMMR reporting is generally looking, as, as I understand it, year to date to year to date. So probably a better, um, a better if, you're, if you're looking to kind of gauge activity in an area, it's probably best to look at the MMR, which is the full year, because uh, let's say you're having a slow first quarter or so, <laughs> that those numbers might get made up in the latter part of the no, year. No, these are annual. Okay. This is the full year annual number. Um, so, lastly, um, this is so helpful. Thank you. And sure, and we can get you, you a further explanation on it. Appreciate that. And thank you for all the work that you're doing on, um, you know, broad, thinking more broadly about sexual harassment training, bystander training, education. Um, when we had our hearing, I think it was the first day DCAS premiered its um, sexual harassment training. Have you had a chance to review that? Is that something that you would consider posting online? I guess two things on that. One, we've been talking, we've been in discussion with DCAS about their training since the, the hearing date. And two, you know, I was I was saying earlier that we are we are considering different ways of um, releasing out to the public our workshops and our trainings. Currently, all of our workshops and trainings yes. are conceived of as in-person trainings. Right. So we are thinking through um, the different ways that we might adjust to put something online. Yeah, I appreciate. It. I overheard that, and I get the in-person. Yep. Way more important. Um, sort of that juggling. We're in that juggling mode of ramping up from zero um, for so many organizations, not clear they can do in-person training. Yep. So you wanna make sure you have something that's good enough. Um, so I was wondering whether or not you thought the DCAS was good enough. There are some other things out there that are so much more eye-catching. Mm -hmm. uh, the David Schwimmer um, things, which I know you have utilized in a sort of different way um, so beautifully, so that's why I'm asking you, because I thought you guys really um, get this idea of trying to catch people's attention, which is what the Schwimmer videos do in my mind's eye. 
And lastly, you uh, did an amazing forum on sexual harassment in December. Um, and I was wondering, it's now March, end of March, when you expect to have the report findings from that, if you have a draft, a preliminary draft that the council could look at, anything you might have. Our final report should be out by the end of April. Is there anything in particular, I mean, just as a, again, as a taxpayer, just sort of wondering why it takes more than three months. Is there a particular hiccup that's holding it back from being reported on? Um, do you have maybe, um, do you have a video of that forum that you could put online that the public could see while we're waiting? Sure. Um, in the interim for that report? Sure, I think the the full video should be available on our website. We could provide you the link to that. We Great. could provide Please you the do. link to that. Um, and the other thing I would say is, so we we took in live oral testimony during the hearing from several different industries, some of which I mentioned in my testimony, but across different industries like, you know, um, domestic workers, construction, tech, media, modeling, um, several different areas, but then uh, after the hearing, we continued to receive written testimony through the end of the year. So one, we want to give you know appropriate and adequate attention to all the testimony that we received, and some of them were several pages long. Uh, and two, I think you know, one of the things that we're trying to do is to provide helpful information over um, a range of different industries. I really don't think that there's anything else like there out there on this topic area to that. So um, in my mind, I would respectfully uh, think, that, uh, disagree with, with it taking a long time. I think we're actually doing it in, in a fairly condensed period, Fair. given the range. Does that, for, in looking at this information, does that, um, I like, I appreciate the thoroughness. I appreciate your answer. My apologies. No. Um, because I really do appreciate the thoroughness. One thing that I felt I heard at our hearing about sexual harassment from the different industries was that each industry might need um, a different type of, I don't, I don't want to go so far as to say training, um, but just different circumstances. And I'm wondering if that could affect the poster um, the piece of legislation that requires a poster mm -hmm. um, that gets put up in, in the private sector. I mean, you could imagine a poster at a modeling agency may be different than a poster at a restaurant for the cooks in the kitchen. Um, do, are you com contemplating any of that as you look at that legislation? or? that idea? You know, I think what's challenging is because we're in New York City and there's just so many different types of industries um, that that uh, uh, call New York City home or that take place in New York City, I think actually what the challenge is is to think of like what is, what are the, the common elements across industry that could provide enough information to so that people, one, understand that they have rights in this space and two, who they should contact, meaning they should contact the Commission on Human Rights to get further information that might be more specific to an industry. Because you're absolutely right, industries are very different and the way that they have to deal with uh, sexual harassment related complaints or the, or the challenges that I think one experiences from different industries can be quite different. There could be um, uh, you know, different challenges experienced by someone who works in an industry where for the, most of the day they're isolated because they're out you know, on location versus somebody who is surrounded by, you know, a lot of other coworkers in an office. So I think I think the challenge in in doing that type of poster or kind of immediate frontline material is finding what's the common element that that causes people to know that they have rights and then who they should contact. I appreciate you, Commissioner. Appreciate your work on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Consumer Rosenthal, Consumer Bell, Carl, us, please. I want to start by uh, thanking uh, the chair, Matthew Eugene, Dr. Eugene, for his work on human rights internationally and bringing that focus from uh, across the globe to here in New York City and looking forward to the great work that he'll be doing in this committee. 
Uh, I'd like to also focus on the preliminary mayor's management report, like my colleague, Councilmember Rosenthal. Uh, we may be the two nerdiest people in the council, but it is good company. Uh, I want to start with a uh, concern about the mediations. The cases successfully mediated in 2015 were zero, 16, zero, 17, yeah. zero, 18 for the first four months, mm -hmm. zero, and uh, there are no targets set for uh, 18 or 19. Uh, is this, uh, d does the human, does the Commission on Human Rights do mediations? Uh, Yes, we do. Uh, I don't know the metrics used for that. Again, I'm, we usually do not testify on the PMMR. I'm happy to look back at that and get back to you. I can say in calendar year 2017, um, our Office of Mediation uh, successfully settled 11 cases uh, and was able to recover about $333,000 um, in those cases. Uh, our, our Office of Mediation has gone through significant uh, changes and remodeling since I got to the agency. Three years ago, the, um, when I got to the agency, there was no Office of Mediation. So we literally had to rebuild it by bringing in a line for a mediator and then restructure it to make sure that people uh, who use the agency or who were aware of uh, our law enforcement abilities would know how to um, uh, avail of mediation in these contexts. So that's in the past year, that's included. So, so let's just, it, uh, w would you work with the Mayor's Office of Operations to make a correction to the PMMR and see it reflected in the MMR? Again, I cannot speak to the number right now because I just don't have it in front of me. I, sure. I will look at it and if a correction needs to be made, we will certainly do that. Fair enough. Uh, this, this wouldn't be the first correction to the MMR made at my request. The next item is, so uh, I, I have particular interest in your agency. Uh, I guess one question is, do you believe that somebody should be able to go to housing court against a landlord who is uh, trying to evict you or, or do wrongful things for you, like uh, removing your, your toilet so you don't have a bathroom anymore or engaged in other ways uh, without facing discrimination for having gone to court? Should, should going to court uh, against your landlord be a human right? I, I can speak to what the categories of protection currently are under the law. It, it's not currently covered. Uh, so we as a city are now funding to the tunes of, I think, more than a billion dollars set aside for uh, protecting tenants from evictions. Yep. And every single one of those tenants is now on a uh, tenant screening report blacklist of tenants who have been in housing court. And some of those folks can't get a new apartment because they are now on this blacklist. So one of the items, it's introduction 85, we introduced it previously, is to say that you should be able to go to court without facing discrimination for having been in court. Uh, so that is a little bit of why I'm focused on some of the numbers. So based on your testimony, you're getting about nine, I'm particularly focused on the Law Enforcement Bureau. How many, what's your head count there? Total headcount is something around 78, but I would have to. So, so that is the bulk 76. of the agent. 76, and how many investigators, attorneys, and so on? And so it's so. primarily staffed with attorneys, okay. uh, and the investigators are actually mostly attorneys as well. So there's an intake unit, uh, or info line unit, I should say, which takes in calls of discrimination or harassment. And so you got 9,772 inquiries, and then how does an inquiry or somebody filing a complaint through your website become one of the uh, 806 cases or is per your testimony 888, sorry. According to the MMR, you had 806 cases in fiscal year 17. So you get somewhere around 9,772 inquiries and then how, how do you narrow that down to cases that are filed? So there are inquiries that come in through various ways into the agencies. Sometimes they come in through the community service centers. They might come in through our website or uh, calling up 311 or calling up the agency directly. Uh, we first make a determination to see if we have jurisdictional authority to even take in whatever that complaint is about. Sometimes people are calling, they think that we have jurisdiction over something. 
you know, we don't. It could be because they're calling about their, um, you know, wanting to make sure that they have uh, heat or hot water, and that wouldn't be our agency in most instances. So we first make sure that we have jurisdiction even to look at the complaint or to look at the claim. And then once we decide that we do, um, if it makes sense for it to go forward into an investigation or for intake, it could get scheduled for intake with one of our attorneys in the Law Enforcement Bureau. Okay, so about 10 per so about 10 percent of the in inquiries you get end up being within your jurisdiction and then get an intake and that's called the case. No, I, I mean I'd have to look at the numbers, but okay. um, something thing could go into the law enforcement bureau and then even from things going into the law, law enforcement bureau, uh, a complaint could be filed, it could be tagged for the violence response team that I testified earlier about, it could be tagged for pre-complaint intervention. There's different ways that that issue uh, could be resolved depending on what the needs of the case are. And so in fiscal year 17, there are about 310 pre-complaint resolutions, not necessarily intervention, so it may be worth realigning your metrics in the PMMR so that you have the interventions and the resolutions broken out. So uh, then once a case is opened, it appears that uh, the vast majority of them are actually end up getting closed without a positive resolution for the uh, complainant with about 24% that are settled and then others that are referred on. So can you help me with the, so 806 cases were filed, 536 were closed, 65% uh, were closed because of administrative cause. I, I don't know if you were here, Council Member Kalis, when I said this, but we generally testify on a calendar year, so you're using numbers that I'm actually not familiar with. So if you'd like, we could, we could uh, consult with the PMMR and then get back to you on your questions, but by statute, we are accustomed to testifying on a calendar year basis. Sure. So. So I can let's, take your numbers, take a, but it's academic to me because I'm, I'm, I just don't have the numbers in front of me. Fair enough. The PMR is, is every single year uh, as part of the preliminary budget hearing, but let's take a step back from the, the numbers. So there's this document here. The numbers may be less useful, but so more than half of the cases are closed because of administrative cause. Are you familiar with what administrative cause means and why so many of the cases that you're pursuing. Sure, so irrespective of the actual numbers, an administrative closure is generally a situation where, you know, it's within the, um, within the agency's interest to close the case, but to not uh, uh, provide a, a probable cause or no probable cause determination. Uh, those could be situations in which there has been an investigation already initiated, um, but rather than come out with a probable cause finding or no probable cause finding, we want to actually preserve the complainant's ability to refile in state court rather than making an election of their remedy at the agency. So I guess what can we do as a council, whether it's on the right to go to housing court or uh, bringing a remedy for sexual harassment, as Councilmember Rosenthal is interested in, so that the, the pipeline that you're bringing in of cases that you have capacity to deal with it, and also that uh, the cases have positive resolutions. Uh, I, I'm seeing, according to the PMR, that it's just quite low that probable cause determinations are only been determined 15% of the time in, in 2015, and then six and 4% in 1617 respectively, and for the past four months just at 6%. So just making sure that when somebody's making a complaint that something positive is coming from it versus some of the adverse actions that happen. I, I practiced employment law, I, I practiced before the State Commission on Human Rights, and uh, almost immediately whenever you bring a complaint for uh, harassment or whatnot, you're also bringing a, a, a similar complaint for retaliation because people usually end up facing some sort of retaliation for having filed a complaint, which is also a violation of human rights. So we are actually a file by right agency. Uh, we are not like the State Division of Human Rights. 
Uh, we're a file by right agency, which means that most individuals who want to file a complaint with us, whether or not they have a jurisdictional claim or not, will file it. And we accept it, and it goes through uh, the type of assessment that I described earlier. So again, there are situations in which we deem it uh, better for the complainant, and I think the advocates would agree that they deem it better for the complainants to preserve their ability and their election of remedy, which of course you are familiar with as a former employment attorney, to go into state court. Fair enough, and just uh, our, one of our committee analysts found that the cases mediated in fiscal year 13 were five, fiscal year 14 was 21, and then it drops down to zero for the remainder. So just, I, I guess, uh, so there's this book, it's called the Mayor's Management Report. They published 40 copies of it, about 1,000 people downloaded. Uh, but the hope would be that if this isn't a document that's useful to you currently for managing your agency, uh, it, to realign it and change the indicators and the critical indicators so that it's something that you can use for managing it year to year and quarter by quarter, as well as something that uh, those of us on the council or on the general public who care immensely about your agency are able to reference and see where things are and where resources you need. Thank you again to the chair for uh, his discretion and this line <coughs> of questioning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Kalos. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, in your testimony, it seemed that, uh, not it seemed, but the budget for fiscal, fiscal year 2019 would be less than fiscal year 2018. Uh, could you tell us uh, how this is going to impact the work of the commission? In what area exactly is going to, which area is going to be more impacted by the decrease of the budget? Sure, I think Council Member Lander had asked me the same question earlier today. Um, that the difference in the budget is accounted for by other than personnel services budget mm -hmm. that was used for a one-time uh, renovation of our current physical space so that we could take in new personnel lines. So we only needed a rollover for that one-time renovation, um, mm -hmm. and so I do not anticipate it will have great impact. Okay. So we had several amendments recently, several amendments, and uh, I think two of them are already in effect, are already effective. Let me see if I can see where they are. Uh, several amendments. The one uh, po that prohibits em employers from inquire inquiring about or relying on the prospective employees' salaries history, effective on October 31st, 2017. Yep. And the other one also that prohibits uh, discrimination on the basis of uniform service. Effective uh, 19, 2017, November 19, 2017. Uh, could you tell us what step or effort that the, commission's, the commission is doing to implement those uh, amendments? Sure. And so if there will be any challenges in terms of uh, uh, resources also, to implement uh, those uh, amendments. Sure. So we are not currently seeing any challenges to implementing either of the amendments. Prior to both effective dates, we issued FAQs that were employee as well as employer side for both of the new provisions so that people would have uh, uh, notice as to what the change in the law would be. For the salary history protection, which was, um, I think, less straightforward than the, um, the addition of uniform services to our anti-discrimination laws, we uh, uh, called together a round table of different employers and businesses and their advocates, uh, and we've been kind of on a road show of going to different CLEs and uh, 
uh, convenings of employers and employer and business advocates to make sure people had a thorough understanding of how we were interpreting the law, which is, a, I think, a fairly novel provision for any locality. We were actually the first locality nationally to have such a, a provision in the law effective. Um, and we've just been responding to, to questions and comments from uh, <coughs> different business based uh, groups and, and, uh, and advocates on that. You know, I love the Community Development Bureau because this is a wonderful job. This is a very important task that uh, the staff for the people in the Community Development Bureau are doing. And uh, the funding of the Community Development Bureau accounts for 52% of the department's total fiscal 2019 budget, and the administration account for 48%. But the majority of the Community Development Bureau's funding is dedicated to outreach in the five ball based uh, community services center that provides uh, resources for New Yorkers to understand their rights and obligation under the New York City human rights law. But we know that we have five balls. Could you tell us the allocation of this funding is equally distributed to the five balls or any, or if there is uh, any difference in terms of the funding or resources allocated to each ball? There's a lot of collaboration between the different borough offices. Some of them are like issue specific rather than borough specific. So each community service center does not manage its own budget. There's a general budget that comes into play for the Community Relations Bureau and there's a lot of uh, partnership and collaboration amongst the different offices. So for instance, I mentioned earlier in my testimony that we put together a form for African immigrants. Um, while that occurred in the Bronx, there was representation there from other boroughs as well, um, both in terms of our personnel as well as community-based organizations that were present. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Sure, thank you. Uh, I think that th that was my last question, but before we uh, conclude, let me commend you and also your wonderful staff for what you are doing on behalf of the people of New York. And we know that uh, human rights is a very, very, very important important uh, uh, area, and all of us from government, from private sectors, citizens, and regardless of our affiliation, belief, and religion, we have to make sure that we have a fair society where the rights of people are respected. And I think that all of us, we should be part of the team. All of us, we should be part of the team. And very important also, especially in New York City and in the United States of America. And I mention that every time. There are so many people who came to New York, who are living in New York. Many of them, they don't understand the system. Some of them, they are afraid to raise their voice, to raise their concern. They are afraid for many reasons, because of the countries where they came from, because of the, their culture, their tradition, they don't want to be in trouble. They don't know, some of them, that they have certain rights, and those rights should be protected. And I think that uh, the Human Rights Commission has a very important task to do, a noble task to do, to inform those people, to educate them, in order for them to live like everyone with dignity and respect. And I want to say that uh, we in the Committee of Human Rights and Civil and Human Rights, we are willing to work together with you to make sure that we protect the, those people, we protect their rights. Thank you very much. Thank and you. we will continue to work together. Thank you.
Now I want to call uh, Sultan Boka. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Boca. Please state your name for the record before you start. Make sure that your microphone is on. Is, is it on? Yeah. Yes, it All is. Right. Um, and um, uh, number one, I appreciate uh, that you come to testify. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you, sir. And I just want to remind you that uh, you have two minutes. Uh, two All minutes right. is a little short, but uh, my name is Zoltan Boka, and since I only have two minutes, uh, you all have copies of my testimony in writing. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to read it to you. Uh, but just to hit the highlights, there is an increased pressure on the New York City Human Rights Commission because federally there is no enforcement, effectively. And at the state level, it was decided about six years ago that the New York State Human Rights Commission does not have jurisdiction over public schools. Um, so what that means in practice is that if you are victimized, uh, let's say, at City University, you are precluded from having any relief from the New York State Division of Human Rights. Uh, this was decided in 2012, and as far as I know, this remains the case today. Um, I myself am disabled due to a childhood brain injury, and I found this out the hard way because I was accepted at the Graduate Center at CUNY, and when I asked them for accommodations, I was expelled within an hour. Um, this was during a time when there was no enforcement at the municipal level effectively. There was no enforcement at the state level, nor at the federal level, which of course makes it easy for them to behave the way they choose to. Um, this that I gave you is part of the record. You can parse it. If you want me to come back later, we can discuss it. But I really think we need to have a serious discussion about whether how you are going to monitor you know, the actions and the status of cases before the commission and how you are going to be able to say, um, look, these were the people who came to you, these were the resolutions that they had, and this is what you decide in these cases and this is what you decide in these. How did you make those decisions and why? And let me close that the reason I come to that is because when I went to the New York City Human Rights Commission after my problems with CUNY, um, they were extremely hostile. Uh, they refused to speak to me on several occasions. And at one point they told me that I should wait it out and if I'm still discriminated against in the future, maybe I should come back then. Um, I doubt that I'm the first person to have these problems or the last. And so I think it's really should be a requirement to have a comprehensive ongoing audit of the commission and to see who is making what claims, what the resolutions are and why. And I think that's some means. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Mr. Boca. And um, I would like to have your uh, testimony. Um, we will look into that. And uh, I sent it to Mr. Perez. Yes, okay. Thank and you very much. Have it in writing as We're well. going to look into that and we will get back to you. Thank you. We'll sir. be in contact with you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. Mr. Audrey Emengs. Thank you. Okay. Do I have another one to read it for the next session? Yeah, very good. Gabriel Lida Rose. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to uh, both of you, of you. And uh, please uh, state your names for the record. And each one of you as two minutes. Thank you very much. 
Uh, yes, my name is Andre Hemmings, and I represent the third railman over at the MTA Metro North Railroad. Mm -hmm. um, here due to violations on civil and human rights, and I want to know what we can do. Uh, we've been trying to go ahead and get with labor relations, uh, diversity of all kind. Uh, there's a lot of racism happening there, so much so that our general supervisor, we have pictures of this person painted with black face, afro, and he's still sitting there, you know, on top, causing uh, anybody who is a minority there to go undergo hardships that are not necessary. Uh, these hardships have caused many of the new people coming in, both minorities and Caucasians, mm -hmm. to suffer injuries and be out of work for X amount of times. We have requested for safety protocols to be uh, carried out the way it should be, but we constantly are denied, and not in a, uh, in a correct fashion, just simply we're brushed off. We bring these things on, nobody does anything. The president of Metro North is aware of these pictures as well. Mm -hmm. I myself at this moment am out of service, is what they call it when they suspend you, with no charges whatsoever. The only answer they give is pending an investigation. Why? Because I went ahead and wrote statements on the, the, the uh, inability of our supervisor to go ahead and address the safety issues that the men are having. Uh, I'm being retaliated upon. I have a friend of mine also who works there, Neil, Neil Gonzalez, who has been terminated almost close to a year for the same exact thing. He was a union rep. So they're shutting down the voice of the people there. Uh, we don't know what to do. We go through the proper channels, nothing ever happens. I want to know. Can you, mm -hmm. you finish? Yeah. Okay. After the meeting, can uh, you wait for me and we can speak? Absolutely. Can you give me all the information that you have? And I will go over, we will go over the information and we will try to get a meeting with you and from there, we'll see how we can help you and address the, that issue. I appreciate it. And please uh, try to compile everything that you have, the complaint and all the documents that you have and uh, just uh, forward them to us and let us have them. Okay. And we'll have a meeting with you to see, you know, how to better handle this situation. I appreciate it. thank you for your testimony. Thank you very thank much. Thank you. Please don't go. Wait for me after the meeting. Absolutely. The hearing. Thank you very much. <coughs> yes, sir. Hello. Um... Should I begin my, my two minutes? <laughs> yeah, no, but please I'll state your name first. Um, my name is Gabriel Leader Rose, um, and I'm here on speaking on behalf of an organization called Good Call. Um, so uh, my organization has put in uh, a request um, for funding from City Council as a uh, citywide speaker initiative. Um, Good Call runs a free 24-7 hotline in the Bronx that allows anyone to get in touch with a public defender right away in case they or a loved one are arrested. Um, based on the um, stories that we've seen and the data that we've seen about individuals going through the criminal justice system and interacting with police, um, individuals' uh, civil rights, their human rights, and their Sixth Amendment rights to an attorney are not fully realized because they do not meet a public defender until right before going in front of a judge, which opens them up to the opportunity to be interrogated without understanding their rights, um, placed in lineups uh, without the involvement of a lawyer, um, and also can create a lot of other uh, issues for people in communities dealing uh, with frequent arrests and being subject to that part of the criminal justice system. Um, over the past 16 months of running our hotline in the Bronx, we've connected over 500 people to free legal support, and we've seen real evidence uh, that having access to a lawyer earlier in the arrest process leads to fairer outcomes and prevents some of the uh, unnecessary and unjust damages that can be caused by a trivial arrest. Um, and so uh, we hope that um, this committee will uh, support our proposal um, and that City Council will help us expand this program uh, from the Bronx to cover all five boroughs of New York City uh, to make sure that all New Yorkers can have access to justice when dealing with the criminal justice system. Thank you very much, sir. This is uh, uh, a very important uh, service you know, that you are providing to New York, to your constituents, uh, I can say to New Yorkers and uh, we need the non-for-profit organizations 
to uh, help us reach out the people and better serve the people. But your request is a budget request. So uh, we cannot really uh, uh, discuss or end all that in the hearing because it is a budget request. So I would uh, advise you to contact the speaker, since it is a request to the speaker office, to contact the speaker uh, office. And of course, we will uh, look into your, your, your organization also. And we always do everything that we can do to support organizations that are doing a wonderful job for the city of New York. So I commend you for what you are doing, and I thank you also for your testimony. Great. Thank, thank you, you much. Thank you. Now, uh, since uh, we don't have no other speaker, the meeting is adjourned.